Thank you everyone and welcome to Structured Literacy an Evidence-Based Approach for English Learners. My name is Elsa Cardenas Hagen from the Valley Speech Language and Learning Center and also a research associate with the University of Houston Times. And I'm excited that Florida is interested in a structured literacy approach for English learners. And I've been talking about this the same thing. I feel like I talk about the same subject over and over and over again, but uh, I'm excited that there's much interest in what more we can do uh, with English learners. So thank you uh, for the invitation. Thank you for joining this evening. And I kind of overdid it. I'm just gonna tell you ahead of time. I overdid it in the slides. I go, I wanna tell them about this. I wanna tell them about that. And it's like way too much, but I'm gonna pace myself. And so here we go. What are we going to talk about this evening? We'll talk about the demographics of English learners. We'll talk about the research and what we know, what we've been up to. I want to especially address language skills this evening and talk about those speech development skills and how we can make connections from language skills to literacy skills. And of course, we're going to talk about the foundational skills of literacy and how we can embed oral language as we're working on literacy. And we know that the ultimate goal is comprehension. And I'll end with some closing thoughts. So as we begin, I always... Sorry, Elsa, um, I, I can, you, we're all so excited for you to, for you to get going. Um, can, if I can kick us off with just a couple of housekeeping. Oh, sure, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and, then I will, and then I will meet myself. Absolutely. Get out of here. Um, so I just want to encourage, so my name is, hi everyone, my name is Jesse Stipe. I'm the president of the Reading League Florida. Uh, we're super excited here to be also joined by our friends and mission partners um, at the International Dyslexia Association Florida branch. Um, I want to encourage everyone to keep up with your state chapter of the Reading League. Um, we'll, 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 I'll talk about uh, Florida's chapter right here at the end. Um, while you are uh, while you're on our on our pages, I encourage everyone to consider joining the Reading League Florida as members or or making a donation. Um, your membership helps us keep the lights on and and keep the high quality PD coming. Uh, for for tonight's webinar, we've opened up both the Q and A and the chat function, um, and so we welcome you, our live participants here, to ask questions during the presentation. Um, Dr. Cardena Sagan will be taking some questions at the end of the presentation. So, you know, chat away here in the chat, but if you have a question that you'd like um, us to address, go ahead and pop that in the, uh, in the Q&A. All right, and with that, let's go. Let's thank go. you, thank you so much. And I do wanna thank the Reading League and the International Dyslexia Association of Florida and for the invitation. And I love that you all are working so closely together to get at all learners at all levels of instruction. And so I do wanna thank um, the research teams and thank my mentors. I've uh, worked alongside with David Francis and uh, Jack Fletcher at the University of Houston. Sharon Vaughn has been a great uh, mentor. And these are all the researchers that I've gotten to work with over these years of which we've done these national studies and, uh, and many of them have done the national reports such as uh, the ones that I will speak to today. And so our work is highlighted in each of those reports. And so we know that there's increasing number of English learners. Uh, uh, the research that I talk about and that I've been involved in has been Spanish speaking English learners. Um, and that's because as we look across the United States, it's almost getting close to 80% of our English learners speak Spanish in the home. But that doesn't mean, ah, oh, there's not speakers of other languages. Uh, Arabic seems to be the second most um, common uh, language. Uh, with less, less than 3% of students. But we know whether we look at these students and we, we're, we're concerned about our uh, students and their proficiency in uh, reading. And we know that you know across the United States, only 34% are reading on uh, grade level. And when we look at English learners, it's even less than that. And in some states, the English learners are only 20% proficient. And so we have a lot of work to do. And, uh, you know, I say it's not the kids, it's, you know, what we're doing. We've got to be more comprehensive in our approach. We really got to know our students, know about their language, know where they are in literacy, um, you know, know how to bring in their language and their culture. 
culture to get them engaged and um, really uh, meet them at their point of need. And so today uh, I'd like to talk about the research and, and what some national reports and so it was in the year 2000 that that National Reading Panel report came out. And it really was demonstrating the body of evidence. And that body of evidence showed that, okay, we see that these foundational skills, the phonological awareness and phonics seem to really help students to get to that, you know, break that code and be able to read, they build their fluency. Uh, but we know that vocabulary and comprehension, the ultimate goal is comprehension. The more vocabulary you have, the greater the comprehension. And so that was wonderful. Uh, but about that time, Dr. Reed Lyon, who uh, was the director of the National uh, Institute of Child Health and Human Development, came to my hometown in Brownsville. We invited him for a speech and, and people asked, but what about English learners? So he gets, goes back and gets Congress to uh, give about $30 million to start the Biliteracy Research Network. And it was by 2006 that finally we had some you know, studies where we could look at developing literacy in second language learners. And these were children um, that you know, live here in the United States and have another language other than English in their home, right? And so if we look at those two studies, we see, all right, what, what's different about these language minority children? What do I need to be doing? And this is what everybody needs to do because it's not, will I get an English learner? It'll be how many will I have, right? In my classroom or in my intervention. And so what the National Literacy Panel on Language Minority Children and Youth really suggested is that you need to adjust your instruction to meet their needs. You need to know that native language and how that develops the second language and know about literacy and how that literacy can develop across languages. And you see there about those cross-linguistic features, that's an evidence-based approach, taking what they know from their native language and applying it to the second language of English. They have resources that we need to capitalize upon, right? And here's something that we do know. As we look across the whole United States, the majority of these English learners are being served in English as a second language, right? Uh, but we are seeing, uh, you know, more dual language programs developing. And that's wonderful because as the National Literacy Panel Report on Language Minority Children and Youth described, students that have those native language and literacy skills, they're going to perform higher than those who were only instructed in English only. So that's something to keep in mind. And what are we doing when we do that? We're helping them to be what I say, metalinguistic thinking about all these features of language and thinking about that and going across the languages, right? Um, we have the Institute of Education Sciences Practice Guide, right? Teaching academic content literacy to English learners in ele elementary and um, middle school. And some of our studies are in here. And I'm just giving you two, there's five recommendations, but two of them have strong evidence after looking at a body of research. And it is as follows, to teach a set of academic vocabulary words intensely across several days using a variety of instructional activities. And today I'm gonna to de demonstrate to you kind of how we have done that, this kind of work. And then strong evidence for integrating that oral language with that written language and doing this across the content areas and understanding that we're language teachers and literacy and language and literacy is in every subject that we teach, whether that be, and by the way, these studies that um, our group was involved in were science and social studies. And you know, so interesting that just across the content areas, you know, to learn math, to learn science, to learn social studies, you need language skills and you need literacy skills. You have to have excellent vocabulary skills. So um, this was um, published in um, 2014. And then we have in 2017, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, um, they had a consensus study report promoting the educational success of children and youth learning English, promising futures, and really looking at, okay, what should we be doing, right? What do we know from this body 
of research that we reviewed, right? So it's developing literacy among the English learners, providing that explicit instruction in the literacy components. And that includes that phoneme awareness and phonics, foundational skills, but also those making sure that we have fluency, reading comprehension and writing because literacy includes writing. And the guidelines for these early years of kindergarten to fifth grade for the English learners are to provide explicit instruction. So our students need to really understand uh, how literacy works in this new language. Sometimes people say, you only learn to read once. And, one, and I'm like, well, I might not know to read in my native language, but now I'm in the second language. So you've got to teach me how this second language works. Of course, having native language literacy is gonna help me right? It's going to contribute to my second language literacy, but I still have to learn about how the language works. You know, what are the patterns of the language and so that I can be successful in reading. But we must be thinking about what works for English learners. You know, they need a lot of verbal supports to make things comprehensible. We need to be developing academic language skills, providing them with wonder, wonderful visuals. We also use technology, like whenever there's abstract things. I mean, it's so wonderful to have technology to really help us to demonstrate some abstract concepts. Um, but we want students to have opportunities to use language, to work together, and we have to capitalize on their home language, their background knowledge, and their culture. So that's your job. That's your job to understand a little bit about the students. You know, what is their home language? You know, what do I know? You know, what can I, how can I learn a little bit about it? And I'm going to talk to you about that. And, you know, what has been their world experiences and their background knowledge? And, you know, I'm, can bring in a part of their culture and, and bringing in their culture, that's not gonna teach them to read, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna help them to be more engaged when you can see yourself and relate to something. And we also know that as they work, we wanna screen for those language and literacy uh, challenges and provide them right there that targeted support in literacy and in language. We just finished up this grant called the uh, MTSS for L's grant, the uh, multi-tiered systems of support for uh, English learners. And um, what we'll say there uh, in meeting the needs of English learners, uh, this is at mtss for lsorg and you'll see that. It's high quality differentiated language. So we have to know that continuum of language, just like we have to know the continuum of literacy. Where are they in that language development? Are they in the early, are they early emergent bilinguals? Are they more intermediate? Are they advanced, right? And so that I can scaffold the language and meet them at their you know, level and work towards getting them to higher levels of language and higher levels of literacy. Um, so, we talk here again, it talks about those culturally relevant principles. Do you see kind of the same things going through national, you know, National Literacy Panel for Language Minority Children and Youth, the IES Practice Guides, right? The National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, Math, and now this similar, similar, everyone coming up with similar themes here that our students need these opportunities for listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And by the way, that is not, <laughs> that's not, oh, this is my time for listening. Now it's my time for speaking. Now it's my time for reading. Next, I'm going to do writing. And sometimes when we go into schools, they're like, oh, we don't have time for writing. We do that after school. No, you know, this is a process. And when we're working, we're working on listening, speaking, and reading and writing. We're working on language, right? That oral language is listening and speaking and that written language is reading and writing, right? But we want to have that native language supports during, during instruction if we can. That means we as instructors have to know a little something about their native language. You don't have to be proficient in the language to bring up and highlight those similarities. And um, be knowledgeable, be knowledgeable about you know, how language develops and how second language develops and how that contributes to literacy. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. So in the MTSS for L's, um, you'll see you've seen this before where we talk about that general instruction in tier one, tier two, that targeted instruction, tier three, very intense instruction in a small group. 
But if you look there, I have those language levels thinking about, you know, are these students at a basic level, intermediate or more advanced level? And you, over here on the outside of the triangle, you see those culturally and linguistically responsive, you know, teaching uh, practices. And so as we work with our students, we're thinking about their language level, their literacy level, you know, if they're going to do just fine in, you know, general education classroom, or do they need more targeted instruction? Um, and, uh, or do they need very, very intense uh, instruction? And so uh, thinking about that and thinking about the student, this is like another model. And with that, we have um, also at this multi-tiered system of supports for English learners, we have some rubrics that really, if you're implementing this framework, uh, there's some tools that will really address um, how this can work for English learners and what you need to be thinking about. And, you know, scoring worksheets and action plans. And so this, these are free resources um, and um, I think some great tools for those of you that might be, you know, campus leaders or school district leaders, this would be wonderful to really see, you know, where are we on this scale of one to five and what can we do to improve uh, upon how we implement and how we address the needs of these students in this framework of MTSS. But everything, I'm a speech and language pathologist, and of course, everything's going to come down to language, right? And so when we think about those components of language, Dr. Bloom and Leahy in 1978 talked about phonology, the sounds of the language, semantics, those words and the meanings of those words, morphology, a way, you know, some good word learning strategies uh, that we can get at. And also it helps us in kind of reading very high level words is looking at those specific um, meaning units called morphemes, and then understanding how words can go together or not go together in the language. But here's something we often forget about. For the student who's an English learner, they're gonna need a lot of work in this area of pragmatics. Uh, this is all about the use of the language. And so I think about, when we think about the use of the language, you know, uh, if you're an English learner, you haven't had the same experiences as this, a monolingual English speaking student. And so you might not know all the idioms and sayings. And that happens to me a lot as an adult and one who, you know, spoke English as my second language. And often I'm always trying to learn those idioms and sayings. And when people, I ask them about it, well, tell me exactly what you mean by that. And where did it come from? That's really getting to higher forms of language. It's also understanding the social use of the language versus the academic use of the language and knowing when to use what and how to engage and have discourse, um, you know, like that conversation, how that works. I'm Latina. And so the way I, I converse is this way, go round and round and round. And one day I might get to the point I'm married to someone of Irish descent, you know, oh, those old Hagans. And you know how he communicates right to the point. He's like, how long is your story going to take? And what was the point? So uh, we have different ways that we communicate and uh, different kind of unspoken rules about the use of the language. And so we have to learn about, okay, this is how it works in this language and this culture. And let me try and fit into that. And you all, since you're working in literacy and you're working in the area of dyslexia, you know about this model of reading development, the simple view of reading that really considers, you know, the foundational skills such as decoding and those language comprehension skills to get us to skilled reading. And Dr. Hollis Scarborough just so eloquently just, and what a beautiful thing when she got, wrote, did and created that reading rope, because it really um, it made it easier to kind of look at, okay, what do we mean by decoding? Yes, there's some foundational skills of phonological awareness and decoding. We know that phonological awareness can contribute to that spelling, and we want that instant word recognition to become increasingly automatic. But all the while, you need to be working on that background knowledge, building the vocabulary, understanding those language structures and how those text structures work so that you can reason through, you can make inferences and become very strategic with your reading. That's how you're going to get to skilled reading. It's that fluid execution of those word recognition skills plus the language comprehension skills. So we've got to be integrating that. And a lot of times when we observe classrooms, we see 
you know, kind of, it, it, you know, it like very choppy, you know, I'm going to do this first and this next, instead of this integrated approach of where I can listen, speak, read and write and address those foundational skills, as well as those wonderful language and comprehension skills. So it was in the year of 2014, it was June of 2014, and I so happened to be on the International Dyslexia Association board at the time. And <clears throat> it was decided that we really needed to have a term to describe this vision for this comprehensive approach to literacy that would be based upon language, the speech sound system, the phonology, the writing system to include orthography, the spelling, the structure of sentences, those meaningful word parts, the semantics and the use. And um, so structured literacy um, was a term to really talk about that instruction and that integrated and comprehensive instruction. And that, you know, we're not just all about biological awareness and phonics. It's not gonna get you far enough. You need to be really thinking about embedding and incorporating um, intentionally and purposefully and authentically um, these skills. And, what I think when I think about biliteracy, and I would love that to be the goal in the whole United States um, to where it's not only one language uh, that we're speaking of, but it's two languages. So really understanding, you know, two or more languages and using those cross-linguistic and cross-cultural features as a strategy and knowing across languages how the system works in phonology, orthography, syntax, morphology, semantics, and that I can read and be an effective communicator and I can understand and communicate using those culturally and linguistically responsive practices. But just because I can read, there's so much more involved in reading. I have to have great attention skills. I have to have uh, that ability to, you know, uh, reason and those reasoning skills. I have to uh, make sure that I'm motivated to read and uh, that I have a great working memory. Uh, so that in working memory, uh, that's so very important because I have to put two and two together to, um, to you know, come up with, oh, okay, now I understand this and I understand this uh, at a deeper uh, level, right? Uh, so that I think that would uh, be important. And as we look at those components of language, uh, we want to make sure, let's see if you all can, <laughs> here's a name, here's a little quiz for you, name that component. Julio was told to chill out. He thought that meant to go outside in the chilly weather. What component of language could benefit Julio? Is it A, B, C, D, or E? Do you want to answer in that um, chat box? Hey, chill out. That's a phrase. I got to know how that works. That would be C, pragmatics. Maria was reading a book and she didn't understand the word reaffirmation. What component of language can assist Maria to comprehend this word? Is it A, B, C, D, E? Re, affirm, shun, ation. Oh, yeah, I think that would be A, looking at those morphemes to help me, you know, figure out the meaning of that word. Andres asked the teacher, I need the thing to cut the paper. What component of language could assist Andres? I need the thing to cut the paper. Oh, he needed that word scissors. So that would be D, semantics, that he needed the word. He knew the meaning, but he didn't know the label, right? And so that's important when you're working with an English learner. Do they have the concept and they just need a new label to that concept? Or do they need both? I need to understand the concept and the new label, right? Uh, so that's important for us to understand with our students. Annalisa thought this teacher said, missed T. But in fact, the teacher was asking for Misty, a student in the classroom. Oh, okay. What did... What did she need? Annalisa really needed to be able to process the sounds and be able to hear, you know, where the teacher, you know, said misty, but not missed T, right? And I guess also the phrasing and that um, emphasis. Roberto told his teacher that yesterday he walked to the park. What component of language? It should have been he 
walked to the park yesterday. So that really is looking at syntax where I'm understanding that, oh, it's in the past tense, right? Some of you might have said also morphology, which that's also part knowing that suffix ed means in the past. But are you aware, I'm not sure if you are, but I I'm a language person. So I have to make sure that you really understand those language milestones. So everywhere in the world, when a baby is born, and right now I have a three month old baby. And just today I heard her going, woo, 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 and saying these noises, it's so cool. Cueing, a uh, cooing, and not cueing. Oh my gosh, that was a slip. <laughs> uh, at six months, you babble. And by the time the baby is one year, 12 months, that baby is saying their first words, right? These are very conservative. Now they're two years. Now they can put two words together. What juice? In Spanish, I would say, mas jugo, right? And they can produce vowel sounds and some of the other sounds like mm and and but those easy sounds, like those sounds made with the two lips and then sounds like ah, and mm. When they're three, they can put three words together, right? And um, they now have more sounds, like the back sounds, like k and g, and then sounds like mm, like t and d. And now they're four and they can, uh, or four and a half or closer to five, you know, so they can speak between four and five words. By the time they're five, it's five word sentences. So if I could keep a rule to myself, one-year-old, one word, two-year-old, two word phrases, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, right? And so I'm kind of getting the gist here of all this language development that happens in these early years. Now they're six years of age. They put six words together in an average and they can do those blends. Those are the last things to happen in speech production, right? Bull, pull, right? In Spanish, that would be the same, bull, pull. But the R blends like br and cr and dr in Spanish, br, cr, dr in English. And then now there's seven. By the time a child is seven, they should have all the speech sounds in their home language, their first language. Now, if I'm a second language learner, it's going to take me a while to learn these new English sounds, right? And now they're anywhere from eight to 12 years. Oh my God, they've developed their language. They're speaking in complex sentences. They academic vocabulary expands their problem solving skills. They're making inferences, they begin to use abstract language, you know, this is as they're moving to another level of language. But as we think about that, I'm going to give you something tricky here. Can you tell me if Samuel's in the first grade and he cannot produce the sound j, is that a delay in speech development if he's in the first grade? What do you think? Yes or no? Well, if I was looking at Samuel and I was thinking about the first grade, we would expect uh, him to have all the sounds. However, if he's an English learner and he's new to English, then that is not a problem, right? That j is not a problem. But if it is a monolingual English speaker, then you would say, yes. Carmen's in the second grade and she speaks in five word sentences. Is that a delay? Well, yes, if she's a monolingual English speaker and we're only talking about English or if she's a, if we're talking about Spanish and she's, you know, a native Spanish speaker and she was in the environment of Spanish, but not if she's just now learning English, right? Marcela's in the third grade and she's inconsistent with her understanding of abstract language. Is this a delay? Absolutely not. That takes years to develop. And so whether it's in Spanish or English or Italian um, or Arabic or Vietnamese, um, we know that that is not a delay because that takes years uh, to develop that abstract language. But today I want you to really understand second language acquisition. So I gave you what are the typical milestones, but the second ones are, if we think about Krashen and Terrell, that pre-production, not saying too much, the early production, the speech emergence, the intermediate language proficiency, the advanced language proficiency. So when you're learning a new language, you're just taking it all in receptively and you're reluctant to speak, but you're still learning, right? It's not that you're not taking in and learning, but then you take a risk and you're at the early production stage and you can provide those one or two word phrases and some short answer 
Uh, and so you're willing to take the risk because you went through that process of good listening and comprehending, and we're willing to take the risk to produce. Now you've got more confidence and more practice. So now you're speaking in simple sentences at the speech emergence stage. Then you've really expanded and you're speaking in complex sentences. You can comprehend up to 6,000 words. You're beginning to ask you know, for clarification. You can state opinions. And then finally, this advanced stage where, wow, you're using complex language with appropriate grammar. Your vocabulary is increased. Um, and what we say is it takes five to seven years to get to that advanced language proficiency stage. So it's important for us to understand first language development and second language development. So we'll know better how to work with our uh, English learners, right? So if Susanna's in the third grade, right? And she speaks in two word phrases, what second language acquisition stage is she in? She's speaking now. So she's in that early production, getting into those you know, two word uh, phrases. Here we've got Manuel, he's in fourth grade. He's using complex sentences, all right? So if he's using complex sentences now, we're gonna say that that's at the D, intermediate language stage. Marco's now in fifth grade, but he's only been in school for three weeks in the United States. And he's using gestures to communicate. So very clearly, that second language acquisition stage is pre-production. He's taking in the language, but not quite yet using it in an expressive form. Cynthia is an English learner in the sixth grade. She now has advanced vocabulary. She can participate in the classroom with very little support from her teacher. So now she's at the advanced language proficiency stage. Tomas is an English learner in the third grade, and he's speaking in simple sentences, right? And so we'll say for him, the best would be that speech emergence with that, those simple sentences. So as you see, when you work with English learners, they're gonna be at different stages of their second language acquisition. And that's for us to know, because we are going to have opportunities to work with them. So today I wanna to give you kind of a general way. I want you to put in your mind right now, write down a student that you're worried about that perhaps isn't communicating orally like you would think his peers are communicating, his or her peers, right? So what would you do for that? So one of the things you can do is collect a language sample where you get them to talk to you, you ask open-ended questions and you write down everything that they're saying. Then you count how many words was that? And you get a grand total. And then you get what we call the mean length of utterances. And then you know, okay, where are they now in this language development? And what are the features that they do have in their language and what's missing so that I can really analyze what they have and where I wanna go with language. So for example, here was a student I said, oh, can you tell me about your favorite movie? Student says, no, like, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, to ask them about what's your favorite book. Student says, no, like, <coughs> and I said books and student just repeated book. <coughs> tell me about your favorite movie. Oh, like movie. Oh, what are your, your favorite one? Oh, Batman. Oh, Batman's your favorite. Uh, what is happens in Batman? So he goes on to say, carve a room and, who else is in the movie? Robin, Robin friend. Well, by the time I got the 50 utterances here and I counted each of them up, uh, the student gave me a to grand total of 71 words and I got 50 utterances. So 71 divided by 50 gives me 1.4. So this student's only using 1.4 words every time they speak. But I saw some potential here. Look, like bowl, no like, like movie, pins fall jump ball, win game, get towel. There was a lot of two words right in there. So I decided, okay, how am I going to get this student to three words? Well, you know what? I could have him add um, pronouns. I know like, I like bowl, right? I jump ball, I win game. And that's how I started. Let's start with I, 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 right? Then let's add he and she. But what about articles, right? I like the movie. 
And so we worked on some of those articles. Now we're at four word sentences instead of one and a half words or 1.4 words. Now, how about some adjectives? Let's start with color adjectives. I, I want the blue ball. I want the yellow pencil. How about size adjectives? I want the big pencil. I want the little ball. And as I went through, within eight weeks, I got that student to five word sentences by working first in what they didn't have. There weren't any pronouns there. Let me add some articles. I, we did adjectives. Then later, added conjunctions. To, you know, it took me a little bit longer for that. And then those prepositional phrases. And so kind of just did it in a systematic way to get to language. And so what we know is, you know, this language system is what's on the left and that contributes to reading and writing. It contributes to that phonological awareness and decoding and spelling. And my vocabulary contributes to my understanding and my reading and my comprehension and my writing. Having syntax, I know how words work. So I can almost predict what words are gonna come next. My fluency is good. My written composition uh, is much better when I have syntax knowledge. And when you give me the opportunities to understand about how language is used, then that helps me to be a better comprehender, both at the listening level and the reading comprehension level. So language is the foundation for literacy. And language supports literacy and literacy supports language. And why do I say literacy supports language? Because as I read and read widely, my vocabulary increases. This is where I get to see very formal language. It's pretty darn awesome. And I, you know, I get to learn more. And with wide reading, I'm just going to improve also in my language skills and my comprehension skills. So the work that I have had the privilege of you know, being included in these studies. And, and the, the study on the left with um, Dr. Vaughn and Mathis, Lenon Thompson, Carlson, Duradola, Serino, David Francis, myself. Um, we not only did this work for one year, but we continued the work and followed the kids. And we did two rounds and basically it was 10 years of work. And when we did this work, we did it, uh, this study that I have here was working in the English language, which that's your kind of, this is your context. Um, and these were Spanish speakers who were having trouble with English reading. And we worked on those five components of literacy, but we made sure to have the additional features for oral language proficiency and scaffolds for those English language skills. For those other children that were being instructed in Spanish, we did the same kind of work, but in the Spanish language and also found statistically significant results in literacy. Dr. Ari and her group also found in their intervention work with children who were struggling, statistically significant differences in literacy, right? In comparison to the control group, but they also worked on vocabulary and meaning and brought in visual supports. So, it's not just working on the literacy skills, it's working on the language, vocabulary skills as you're working on literacy. And that's the message that, you know, I really hope to give you today. And so in our work, um, we always had literacy support activities. We knew, looked to think about, okay, what are gonna be the challenges for language? You know, what do we have here in the lesson that could be a challenge for um, my English learners? And so let's get some specific targets for oral language and vocabulary as we work on literacy. And so the this support is vital to effective work with students and especially needed for those who are needing interventions I and mean, really in any language and struggling readers really need tailored you know this is especially tailored to them to meet their language needs and to meet the literacy needs so that they can also you know achieve a lot of progress so that's so important and it's also important for you and i don't care if you speak the language or not to know cross linguistic features and i'm going to just tell you, look right here. This is just an example of the Spanish and English examples that are the same. Look, you know, b and k and d and f and g. All of those Spanish and English consonant examples 
there, a hundred percent transfer right there. I can also show you some in Arabic and English, right? We talked about Arabic being another language uh, <clears throat> that we see as um, in the homes of our English learners. And so you see there some of the same kind of sounds like b and d and k and u and m. And then if we looked at Vietnamese, same thing, right? B, d, f, k, u, m, m, p. Amazing. So here's some connections we can be making. Now, how am I going to know these connections? There's a website called mylanguages.org. And in there has more than 80 languages. And you can look and see, well, which sounds, right, in this language are similar to the English and what can we capitalize upon? That's how we really, you know, get to know a little bit about the structure of the student's language, right? And what are some challenging sounds in English? Well, that those short vowel sounds, ah, eh, eh, ah, uh, right? The schwa sound, that sh or the zh or the aw ah, or mm, those are challenging sounds. And so we have to explicitly work on them, but we can work on them through sound approximations, right? For example, put your hand on your vocal cords and say the sound ch, ch, ch. I have that sound in the Spanish language, but I don't have the sound j in Spanish. But since I already know ch, how can I make a connection? Say ch, ch, ch. Oh, your voice isn't vibrating. Those vocal cords don't vibrate. Now say with your voice box on, j. Turn off your voice box, ch. Turn it on, j. Turn it off, ch. Turn it on, j. In the Spanish language, we have that Spanish medial D. If I said the word for finger, dedo, that middle D says th of English. That's why I write the word father, F A D E R, and I say, good for you, you know the sound. But in English, we use T H. The Spanish value, right, is the English O-O as in moon. So if they write moon, M-U-N, say good for you. You heard the right sound, ooh, but we use O-O, not you. Spanish has a trilled R, right? Uh, we have to learn to soften that, which is hard for us. But there's also an R in Spanish that's soft. Like if I said the word for face, that would be cara. And that medial sound is really like the medial T or D of English. We call it a, a, a flat. So when they write the word letter, L-E-R-E-R, -E -R, that's because in Spanish, the R is that medial T. Or they write ladder, L-A-R-E-R, -E right? That R, that soft R is the medial D between two vowels of English. So those are connections. And a lot of times, even my Spanish speaking teachers don't know those connections. So that's important to find those connections, right? In Arabic, there's not a p sound, but b does exist. So let's do the same thing like we did with the CH, right? Say b, now turn off your voice box. P. That's a voice voiceless pair. There's no v sound in Arabic but there is. So what are we going to do? Say with your voice box on. There's no initial S consonant blends, just like in Spanish, there aren't either. So I tell them, don't add an extra vowel. Show me your teeth. Spaghetti. Sprite. Show me teeth. Don't open your mouth until you've already produced that sound. In Vietnamese, there's mostly one or two syllable words. Those then when you're reading English words with more than two syllables, that can be challenging. So we can, you know, kind of teach them how these syllables work and how you can, you know, blend those together to read those challenging long English words, right? Consonant clusters, just like for the Arabic speaker, for the S blends, that's going to be difficult. The new sounds, ah, oh, they've got ch and j in English. But in Vietnamese, they have sh and z, right? So if I could say ch, but then I can say it by stretching it out, sh. If I could say j, but now I'm going to stretch it out, j, that gets me close to z. Like in words like explosion, intrusion, treasure, pleasure. Those are challenging for Vietnamese speakers. So I hope I'm showing you how to make these connections across the languages. 
And we also have some good news for you. Phonological awareness transfers across languages. If we look at Spanish and English, we find this correlation of phonological awareness at 0.92, right? That's 0 0.08 off from it being a perfect correlation. So maybe it's just because I've got some new sounds. In Spanish, we have about 22 sounds. In English, we have about 44 sounds. And so it's very helpful uh, to think about. And as we work on phonological awareness, what we'll do different is we'll focus on the new sounds if they already have it in their language, right? So here's an example. My new sound is J. We already practiced that one, J, J, J. J, J, J. So we're going to focus on the new sound and we're going to make connections. What's different for the English learners, we'll make connections for the new sound and we'll make connections for the vocabulary, because if not, then it'll just seem like a nonsense word. So say the word ham, change. J. What's my word? Jam. Oh, look, I have some strawberry jam, right? We're going to put it on the toast spread. Say the word bet, change b to j. The new word is jet. Can you say it? Yes. So there's an airplane, but another word for airplane is jet. Say the word pig, change p to j. What's the new word? Jig. Oh, let me show you what a jig is. And also some of these have multiple meanings. So we're going to cover those too in just a moment. Say the word hog, change p to j. The new word is jog. And look, this girl will run at a steady pace. She's taking uh, this afternoon, she's going on a jog. So in a little bit, we could also go over that there's multiple meanings for jam and jet and jig, but let's make the connection to the written form. So we've been practicing this new sound with j, and you were able to substitute the sounds, but now let me give you some more words, jam, jog, jet. What was it, the same sound you heard, j? Now let me show you the letter. It's j, right? Do you recognize this letter? Yeah, you have it in your language. What is it? They might say jota. Oh, say the word jaguar. Did you have this word in your language? Jaguar, yeah. But in your language, you say ha. In our language of English, we say j, all right? Uh, do you understand the word jaguar to help you remember that sound j? All right, let's use the word jaguar in a sentence. Um, the jaguar can run very fast. So the letter is J and the sound that it makes is J. And to help us remember, that would be jaguar. We're also going to extend into writing and reading with this letter. You now know the sounds. You were able to play and manipulate with those sounds. You see the letter. And we were able to go through the sound. We were able to go through how it was connected to your language. And we were able to use it. So English, what do I need to learn if I'm learning English? Well, I, let's say I already know how to read in my home language, like Spanish. Oh, that looks familiar. In Spanish, I would say ten. Oh, what does it mean in English? Ten, it's a number. Oh, when it comes, when that consonant comes after the vowel, the vowel will say eh. I don't have to learn that in Spanish because the vowel sounds never change. In Spanish, I would say no. In English, you say no, right? So it ends in a vowel and it makes a long vowel sound. There's a tonal difference between no and no. Oh, I have this pattern in my home language, dame. That means to give it to me, right? But in English, when we have the vowel and the consonant E, you're going to say the long sound, dame. What does that mean? Then we have a vowel pair. Be careful with this one. I want to say pie, which means foot. But in English, that IE here says pi, I. The vowel R, I will say mar, right? That has a different meaning than mar. And then this looks similar. In Spanish, I have cable. In English, that would be cable. So it's so interesting that I can find these patterns in my home language, but I don't need to worry about them because the vowel sounds never change. The vowel sounds never change. So now let's link what I practice the sounds, I practice the letters, right? And now I'm going to practice reading. But we can bring in language during our decoding practice. And ah, decoding practice, it's so boring, but I want to practice because I want to see. I've taught you some vowels, right? Some short vowel sounds followed by at least a con one consonant. 
So we're going to have them practice reading words like jam, jet, jig, jab, jan. And notice those were some similar words that I did in phonology and I did in the discovery of that letter J. But as we go through and I have them read, I might ask them, okay, look at the first row. Can you read the words that not only have the J sound, but have the A ah after it? Jam, jab, jan. Oh, good for you. I like the way you're thinking about the sounds. You've read beautifully this next row of Jim, Job, Jack, Jen, Just. Can you tell me which one of those words are person's names? Jim, Jack, Jen, correct. How did you know that? Yeah, it had a capital letter, good for you. Let's read this, the next row and Jet, Jig, Jen, Jack, Jab. And you can you tell me uh, which one of these words can be a noun, a verb and an adjective? Ah, uh, we talked about the noun when we did phonological awareness practice, jet. But we're gonna, when we're finished today, we're gonna jet out of here, we're gonna go fast. And I have jet black hair, right? That describes my hair color. Or we might have an inkjet printer. For pragmatics, let's look at the, this next row. Just, jam, jig, jab, jet. If I wanted to say the phrase, I was only kidding, what word could I use in place of that? You can say the phrase, I was just kidding, right? And that's getting at a phrase and that's addressing pragmatics. And when we do these kinds of routines of looking at the components of language as we're reading, guess what the students do? They think on a deeper level, they really do. And so they're thinking more deeply about, oh, let me think about the sounds and the meanings and how I'm gonna use it and how does it function and does it have different functions, right? Uh, are there any sayings that I can use with these words? And so they're not only practicing, you know, this foundational skill of being able to read the words in front of them, they're thinking about the language features of the words as they read. And that's how I can really bring language into my reading practices. And oh, here's some multiple meanings of jam. We talked about strawberry jam already, but I want to listen and jam to the music. Another saying, oh, I was stuck in the traffic jam, right? So there's multiple meanings of jam. We talked about the multiple meanings of jet, right? Type of airplane goes fast, the inkjet printer, we're gonna jet out of here. So we worked on bringing to light those new sounds of the language, being very focused and targeted in the phonological awareness, linking it to those letters, linking it to the vocabulary and the phonology and the syntax and the grammar. And now we're going to put it all together. So we want to make sure that we're giving them practice for fluency. And that will be at the word level. We move to sentences and uh, paragraphs. And what happens to the English learners is they often do pretty well at learning the code and we get excited about that. But we have to be really attentive to them understanding what they're reading in this new language. And don't just think because they can read now fluently that that's going to really make a difference with reading comprehension. You're going to need, we know that, you know, that reading fluency and comprehension is moderated for the English learners by their oral language proficiency. So that's why we've really got to be working on oral language proficiency as we're building their reading skills so we can get to the ultimate goal of comprehension. All right, so what I want you to remember just in this section that I've covered on these foundational skills, that foundational skills are only a part of this comprehensive approach to literacy. Uh, so that decoding practice that we did, that phonology practice that we did, the phonological awareness, uh, but what I was trying to demonstrate to you is to focus on where are they in their oral language skills? How can I bring in language as they're developing their literacy? How can I capitalize on what they already know from their home language? How can I be more intentional and authentic? And how can I also be thinking about, oh, how can I make it culturally and linguistically responsive to them? So let's bring in some oral language. Let's bring in some of that as we think about um, this. And remember what I said from the IES practice guide, you know, you're going to be learning words and working with the words across many days. And we know that students have to have at least, you know, 15 to 17 opportunities to use a word to really understand it and have it right in their repertoire of words. And so we're going to talk about introducing topics and naming and rapid naming and bringing in retrieval plans for that, but also some good 
word learning strategies for English learners and the opportunity to engage in oral language through describing and retelling, right? And so here's some ideas of what you can do to bring in oral language as you're working with these students. And so, you know, when we work, we like to work around a central idea, like a theme. And so I can be talking about something like transportation, right? And I'm also going to be wanting to talk about, oh, how that works across the languages, right? Like in Spanish, that would be tractor, in English, tractor, tren is train, canoa, canoe, helicóptero is helicopter, right? But I'm going to bring in a lot of support for my students, bringing in those visuals, talking about how we use the different modes of transportation, what are they for, but also thinking about the verbal fluency. So we've had this discussion and in speech and language, we measure verbal fluency to see how, you know, individuals will do. And so in verbal fluency, we give you one minute to name as many items as you can within a certain topic. And the goal is for very young students to be able to name about eight items, for a little bit older students to name about 15 items in one minute. The kids love, we do this as games, they love it. Um, and so, you know, we've been talking about transportation. So now I want you to tell me all the different types of transportation. Let me give you one minute, right? But what I also want to give them, if they're stuck and they can't come up with it, I want to give them a retrieval plan. What's that retrieval plan? Well, can you tell me about transportation by air? Have we talked about some of those? Can you name them, right? And they might say something like a helicopter or a jet. How about the transportation by sea? They might have said submarine or a ship or a canoe. Transportation by ground, they might have said something like a bicycle, right, or, or a motorcycle, or uh, even um, uh, a, an auto or automobile. So that's the retrieval plan. And some people have to visualize, some people we subcategorize, but we're trying to get them to be very fluid and we get to that verbal fluency. And we're only getting to this after we've introduced the topic and they know something about it. We've given them the support that they need to get to that verbal fluency. But I also can bring in rapid naming, can't I? So really bringing, again, thinking about that fluidity. So as I bring in what we've talked about. Ah, here's some pictures for my rapid naming of some things that we've been talking about for transportation. Let me review with you. We have a train, tractor, canoe, helicopter, an auto, and then it changes order. Tractor, train, helicopter, auto, and the canoe, and so on and so forth. And then I practice with them. I go, okay, let me see how fast I can do it. Time me, time me. Now let's see how you can do it. And it's really getting to the automaticity of those words. We've already talked about the words. We've already talked about their features. We've already talked about their meanings. Now we're just talking about the fluidity, right? So I can bring in rapid naming skills uh, as I'm also working with vocabulary. And then as children are reading to me, I can bring in rapid naming with that, right? Maybe they were having some trouble reading some of those words. So let's practice reading them with more fluidity. Or maybe uh, they were having trouble writing some things. So here's a sample of the writing. It was a stormy day and the little girl name is Sandy and the tree's on fire and the man has a hose to put the fire out. Oh, it didn't say hose, put hole. Because the house could burn and there's a storm heading to the town and people are going to their home because the children could get sick. Oh, I think about, wow, here's the story. I get it, it's written. I'm gonna need to work some on, you know, um, some of the spelling patterns, right? And maybe some words there. We need hose and we need firefighters in there. So let me practice with the rapid automatic naming. That's hose, fire, tree, firefighter, hose, a fire, hose, firefighter, tree, tree, firefighter, hose, fire, firefighter, tree, fire, hose. So once again, I brought in rapid naming. I looked at the writing, saw some vocabulary that was needed there, and I wanted to bring it with fluency. But some of the best word learning strategies for English learners include cognate awareness, and morphological awareness and making those connections, the metamorphological awareness. So remember we were talking about, well, just look here. We were talking about transportation. One of the things we talked about was canoe. Look how it's similar in English and Catalan. Look in Spanish, canoa, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese. 
look at French, look at German, right? So we can find these similarities. Uh, here's the theme of occupations and here's, you know, cognates with Spanish and English, right? And as we go through that, what I teach them is let's look at the words across. Let's see how they're the same. Let's look at how they're different. Uh, let's see if we can compare this word to another word, right? Like an author to uh, maybe like an architect. And is the word a noun or a verb? Can you use it in a sentence? How is it the same? How is the spelling the same, right? Are there other meanings of the words? Or is it just one meaning? So right here, what I did is I went through the sounds, the vocabulary, the morphemes, the grammar and the pragmatics. Do you notice a pattern? I've been doing that in everything that we do. So we've been adding language, right? To, and those components of language to, even that word learning strategy of a cognate. I do the same with morphemes. Oh, there's so many morphemes across the languages, especially Spanish and English. 60% of the English language comes from Latin. So that's so super cool that I can you know, teach them these word parts. Like we've been talking about, you know, the jobs that people do this week. So look, say artist and pianist and dentist. What was the same that you heard at the very end? It was ist. Ah, do you have these words in Spanish? Do they look the same? Ah, artista, pianista, dentista. In Spanish, it was ista. In English, it was ist. And it means like the one who. If you draw pictures or you create sculptures, you're considered an artist. If you play the piano, you can be considered a, at the ending, pianist. If you fix someone's aching tooth, you're a dentist. So suffix is means the one who. Let's think of some more. If you fix flowers and arrange them in the vase, you could be considered a florist. If you play the guitar very well, you can be known as a guitarist. If you give therapy, you're known as the therapist. Do you know any of these in your language? Yeah, therapista, florista, guitarista. So let's try and use these words. And sometimes we come up with games and we have competitions. We build a tree, we have leaves to it and we try to create as many words. And every time we're talking or reading or listening to read alouds, and as we think about you know, the words and the challenge words, let's think about those word parts and if we can figure it out. And what I wanna say is I never got this opportunity until I went to college. And you know who taught me this? Dr. Daly. I still remember him. And it was Greek and Latin roots for medical terminology. And I learned so much about the language and where words come from. And I learned about these meaning units. And it really helped my vocabulary to soar. And I'll never forget that. And we know young children, especially the English learners, can do this kind of work. And we can make those connections across languages. We can also bring in opportunities to describe, right? We're still working with the same words. So each day, it's kind of like each day, I love to do like a different activity around the words. I can do the introduction and look at the cognates. We can do the rapid naming. We can do describing another day. And I like to introduce the students to kind of a sequence of how they do describing. And we actually did this in a study with preschoolers. And what ended up happening is they ended up with a lot of adjectives in their language. But if you look right here, name, category, shape, feel, size, color, make a simile, make a comparison. And actually, not only can we use that for oracy, right? We can also use that as an organizer to write a descriptive paragraph, right? So if I wanted to describe, and we were talking about transportation, maybe I described the helicopter, right? What is it? It's a helicopter. What category does it belong to? We've been talking about the category, transportation. What's it used for? Have you ever seen a helicopter? I saw an accident on the highway and the helicopter had to pick up, you know, one of the persons that was in the traffic accident. They went to the hospital that way, right? Or I took a helicopter ride once. Um, and what was the color? What colors do you see here? White and red. What shapes is the helicopter, right? It kind of looks like a bubble there. And look at that 
I see that metal blade. It looks long. But now let's compare it to the jet. Ah, they're both ways to travel by air, but the jet is much bigger, right? It can carry many more people. The helicopter can only carry like two or three, right? What does it look like, right? Uh, what does that jet look like? What does that helicopter look like? Can we make a simile? Can we make a metaphor? So these are ways we can think, have and organize them. And the Nighthouse Education Center has this describing hierarchy that I just love and I use when I work with my students uh, because it really gets them organized to do these kinds of describing activities and uh, the children love it. And then we can take from oracy and what they're doing here and we can link it to writing. Remember, listening and speaking and reading and writing. It's a process. And then, oh, in our studies, we included retelling. In one of our studies, we left it out and we didn't give it its great results. It's when we kept it in. So it's worth this keeping it in. And retelling really helps them to have another opportunity for oral language and vocabulary. It's important that we provide those models and the scaffolds that they need, visuals, uh, think about the vocabulary. Uh, and then they, re, you know, after you practice and model, then let them practice with one another, kind of these cooperative groups. So as we think about, oh, I've been, maybe we'd start with simple ones like narratives that tell a story and, you know, there's a character and a setting and a sequence, and there might even be a problem and a solution. But let's think about if it's a sequence or something, you know, is there going to be a beginning, a middle and an end? Are there going to be any words in there like a first and middle and then and next and last and finally? And how can I link it to something we've been talking about? Well, we've been talking about transportation and I want to link it to perhaps maybe the students who might have ever lived on a farm. And I want to tell you just um, on, um, actually it was on, Tuesday uh, that um, um, Cesar Chavez, uh, his grandson came to our town and I got to see and meet him and listen to, you know, all the, the challenges of, you know, working uh, in, and being a farm worker. And so this really brought to light. I was like, oh, I have a passage about farm life but it really brings in some of their cognates and some of the words they've been thinking about. So this is about Samuel. He lives on the farm with his family and his father, Danielle, grew up on the farm and continues that farming tradition. And Samuel is, Samuel is able to help with all of the chores of the persons that live on the farm. He likes using the tractor to keep the farmland well manicured. What does that mean? Like we have a manicure with our fingernails. The grass can be well cut. The tractor is used to cut and make hay that his father can sell, and that's typically his first choice chore of the day. But when Samuel finished his first chore of the day, his dad said next he would have a big surprise for him. Samuel could practice driving his grandpa Longoria's auto. It was a classic. Samuel was so nervous that he forgot how to start the engine. Luckily, his dad showed him. Grandpa Longoria would be so happy to see him driving the auto. And finally, Samuel was driving along the farm at a very slow speed because he wanted to be very careful with this special auto. He drove by the pond where he saw the canoe that they, that they could use on the rather large pond. Samuel kept driving, right? And he saw some grapefruit trees and he knew that soon he would be picking the fruit from the trees but just right now he was really going to enjoy that time on the farm driving uh, his grandpa Longoria's classic auto. So what I would do is I would bring in some visuals for my students especially my English learners and I would retell in my own words this was about Samuel and he lives on the farm. He has they have a tractor on the farm and Samuel helps to cut right? The grass and make the hay with the tractor. One day, his father, uh, Daniel, said he could drive Grandpa Longoria's um, classic auto. And as they were driving along the farm, they went by the pond and they saw the canoe. And Samuel also saw some beautiful grapefruit trees that he knew that later he would have to pick. But right now, he was enjoying driving along the farm in his Grandpa Longoria's classic auto right? And so I might 
you know, put numbers on this. I make sure that I want them to answer in complete sentences or retell in those complete sentences and be a good model. They can get with a partner and they can practice, but that retelling, you know, it really solidifies their understanding and gives them lots of practice for oral language and vocabulary. Finally, it's been a couple of days that we've been working on this. I introduced, you know, the central idea. I introduced words that were cognates. We looked at some of the words that were actually also could be uh, considered morphemes. And then um, we did rapid naming. We did describing. We did retelling. But now we're going to do convergent naming, uh, that ability to synthesize. So now I want to see how much you learned. And let's synthesize. I'm going to give you some hints. I'm a type of aircraft with a spinning metal blade attached to the very top. What am I? That's right. Helicopter. I'm another word for car that you learned this week. What am I? Auto or automobile. I have a conductor and I run on tracks. I rhyme with the word rain. What am I? You learned it. Train. I'm a type of boat that you must use paddles to drive me. What am I? That's right. Canoe. I'm a large, powerful truck used to pull farm equipment. What am I? Tractor. So as we put together, I want to leave you with the evidence-based practices that we know of for reading comprehension. And I put it into an acronym for you called 3PV3RQ. And the reason I did this was to help bring in some of those evidence-based practices that we know of, that when we start, you know, we're going to really be thinking about reading and thinking about comprehension. We start with what's the purpose of the reading. And we always have to prepare the connection to explore the English learner's background knowledge. We can make a prediction from the titles or the pictures and we explore that vocabulary and look for words. I like to look for words that have those morphemes or cognates. Our students will read, right? But we will provide a review and a model retell so the students can retell. And then when we look at those national literacy reports, it says the students will have opportunity to question, but also to generate questions. And so by doing the 3PV3RQ, it helps me to remember the kind of features that I need to put in as I'm really trying to get to that deeper comprehension. And as we've been reading and as we have that central idea that I've brought in because of the oral language, um, that's so very important to our students. And finally, in our intervention practices, we always had a read aloud. And we only used one book for the whole week. And we read just a few pages each day, but the students love those read alouds. And we select them to be related to the topic. We even did this in the science studies where we brought in books related to science that uh, were related to the concepts that they were learning. And we got great results. And those results are written up on the Institute for Education Sciences Practice Guides that are published by the United States Department of Education and the Institute for Education Sciences. So it takes us five days to follow that cycle. We preview the book. We think about some of the language structures that are in there and we scaffold for that. We guide that discussion and that questioning so the students understand you know, what we're talking about, what we're reading about. We have visuals to support. And we also provided you know, when necessary, the books in the native language. So uh, you know, sometimes we would introduce, introduce it in the native language and then introduce it in the English language. But this read aloud, um, they really loved them. They had opportunities to develop world knowledge and vocabulary and oral language and comprehension. Uh, it was listing comprehension, but that really can contribute, right, to that overall comprehension. And we always make sure to include and incorporate various cultures and expand that world knowledge for our students. So, you know, I want to leave some time so we can have a discussion, but when you're teaching English learners, it's going to be important for you. Teachers teach, and it's going to be important for you to think about that first language, their home language, the second language of English. Where are they in that continuum of language development? Where are they in that literacy development? And every chance we get, let's capitalize upon the native language for the development of that second language. And no matter what we're teaching, let's always think about what's my language goal and what is my content goal, right? What am I trying to teach here? 
Uh, or if I'm teaching, for example, science, I think about my language goal, I think about my literacy goal, and I think about the science concepts that they have to learn. Whenever possible, really become familiar with those cross-linguistic features of language and try to use as much as possible those effective word learning strategies of the cognate awareness and that morphological awareness uh, for uh, the students. That's gonna be uh, very, very uh, important. Uh, and we want to be you know, uh, uh, providing opportunities, providing discussions, but making sure that we did teach it explicitly so that they can learn it. So I talked to you about MTSS for L's and dyslexiaida.org. At Colorín Colorado, there's some uh, <clears throat> videos for English learners and experts talking about English learners. Uh, at the University of Texas, Austin, we have the Meadow Center uh, that has like top five things to do or top 10 things to do. Uh, recently at the University of Houston, we have a new center for the success of English learners. It's really dedicated to adolescent English learners. The project just got off the ground, but be on the lookout for more about adolescent literacy. We have so much more research to do in this area for adolescent um, English learners. And that's going to be at ccellcenter.org. And uh, thank you to Jesse for talking about Literacy Foundations for English Learners, this comprehensive guide to evidence-based instruction, really tried to kind of put it in a kind of research to practice format so it'll be easy to read and easy to understand what we currently know and what we still need to know uh, for working with English learners. Uh, we really need to get to that implementation science. And uh, here are some references that I used. But remember what I said, that language supports literacy and literacy supports language. And we know that literacy is that bridge to equity. And we're so concerned about that today in the world that we live. So I need for you to be prepared to teach every student, including our English learners. And I'm so happy that so many of you joined today because that gives me and inspires me to know that you really care about these students and you really wanna be comprehensive in your approach uh, in working with them. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cardenas Agan. That was, that was excellent. That was jam packed with, with tons of useful information. And there's a uh, comment here in the chat, which I think summed it up very nicely. I've been studying and teaching uh, TESOL for almost 20 years. This was by far the most explicit, concise, and useful training I have heard. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was very nice. And you know what? I put too much in there. I know it, <laughs> but I can't help myself. I want you to know everything. <laughs> So the uh, right, the comments in the chat were coming fast and furious, and there are some excellent questions that I want to get to in the in the Q and A with yes. the last about ten minutes that we have yes. here. But before that, I just want to uh, one more time kind of encourage everyone to visit us at fl.thereadingleague.org um, or visit us on Facebook at the Reading League Florida. Um, you know, I encourage everyone to to, con to consider joining us um, as members or, or making a donation. We are an all volunteer 501c3 nonprofit organization. And so this is only a labor of love that we do for free in our spare time. And every, every penny from donations go right back into the organization for things like, or like insurance and other logistics. Um, so please consider supporting us here. And all right, let's get back to the content. So there are, uh, right, so there are a couple of questions here. Um, the first one that came in um, towards the beginning of the presentation is if you have kind of general recommendations um, to implement structured literacy for English learners with interrupted formal education, there were a couple of comments also about well, how do we respond to, to remote instruction and interruptions? If you have any general advice for us. Right, so <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, I, I want to say, um, what I want to say about that is we have to, <laughs> that's why we have to investigate and get whoever their caregivers are is get information uh, from them because it's so important, like what you're saying. And that's what we found in some of our studies. I mean, we would be working in third and fourth grade and found, oh my gosh, they never really had the opportunity. And then guess what? There weren't resources in the classroom that we could use. So, you know, 
how are we going to get them what they need? Let's work in some small groups. Um, and so I think, I think it is us knowing our students and knowing what opportunities they had and didn't have. And by the way, I want to tell you, sometimes the gaps are our fault because, I, you know, we've been in some school districts where, okay, we tried this language of instruction model. Oh no, now we're going to switch to this language, or we're going to move the student from this language of instruction model to this one. And that caused gaps. So not all of them are because there was gaps in attendance and where they went to school, but also gaps in our language of instruction model and we have to fill those gaps so it's very important for us to know our students and then we have to work and find because I know the struggle I mean we're in third grade and we needed stuff from first and second grade to you know and we made a commitment to the district okay we're going to get up to the third grade level but we got to do this uh, intense work um, and so that's very funny uh, by the way I see in here that y'all wrote about Dr. Crash and I have to tell y'all a story I was presenting, we were presenting and both of us were invited to the Library of Congress to give a presentation. And of course, after we were done, he had a lot of criticism. And I said, well, come and meet me and um, let's, let's have coffee. And, you know, I invite you. So he walked with me back to my hotel and we're there having this deep conversation about, you know, what, what's the issue here. And um, this other gentleman's listening to us and he comes over and joins our table and he was the head of the Teamsters and Dr. Krashen was more interested in him than, than continuing our discussion. And I thought that was going to be it. I come back to my home and Dr. Krashen's right back at it. And so I'm like, let's have a discussion because here is what I want to tell you. It is fine. We can't all agree on everything, right? We can't all agree on everything, but here's, I want to give you, I want to give you this advice, LC, listen to me. What do I mean by LC? This is my motto. I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn and I'm going to lead them on that journey to literacy, right? And we've got to be good communicators and we've got to be open-minded and it's okay, Dr. Krashen, let's talk about it. Let's, let's talk about what are the issues that you have, you know, with the kind of work that we're doing. And, you know, I, you know, really, you know, respect your work and thinking about language and second language acquisition. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, I think this is very important. So we're going to be good listeners, right? And we're going to learn, and then we're going to lead to literacy. But we have to be good communicators. Excellent. Well, very well said. Very well said. Thank you for that. Um, going back to to one thing, you're taking a look inward. There's there's a concept in multi tiered systems of support, as you know, MTSS. The the acronym, like we need more acronyms, but it's ISIL, I C E L which are which stands for the, the the factors that we have to take a look at when we're looking at students lack of response to instruction and it goes instruction curriculum environment then learner right and those are very purposely ordered there in the learner yeah. there comes like let's look at our instruction and curriculum and environment first right and i i want to tell you like right now i'm going to give you an example we have what's called in our research study right now, it's like a research to practice one called model demonstration for dyslexia. And, and here's what I want to tell you um, that as we go in and look what's going on in the core instruction, we realized that we were going to have to ask the project officer if we could spend some good amount, like the first year, which is this year, on really looking at the core instruction and seeing what they're getting, right? Because how can you ever, you know, be determined that, you know, you might have this disability of dyslexia if you don't have excellent core instruction. And so, um, so we've spent some time and it's really been uh, so wonderful because that's what we need to see that integration of language and literacy and integration of that continuum of language and that continuum of literacy and not this like choppiness that we see do this and then that and that and that that language is a process and literacy is a process and uh and so it's been wonderful to kind of see and gradually see the changes and what's happening but always through a collaborative that i you know i always say i'm going to learn from you you're going to teach me too and 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 hopefully i'll teach you a few things 
Um, but I want to listen and learn from you, just like hopefully you'll listen and learn from me too. Yeah. So I know we have we have just a few minutes left here. Sure. So we have we have 10, 10 questions in the QA. We are not going to be Ooh. able to get to them. Okay. <laughs> um, but I, I think on that same subject, someone asked um, if you could speak a little bit to early identification um, for English learners for disabilities. Yeah. But now, yeah. this, you know, according to this person or in their in their district or in their area, they aren't considered long-term English learners until about five years in, but how can we get teachers to identify struggling readers before that? Yeah, Actually. yeah. So, uh, you know, um, so I live in Texas. <laughs> and um, so since 1998, um, we developed at um, the University of Houston at Times and the University of <clears throat> Texas Health Science Center, Houston, uh, some tools um, back then called T uh, Texas Primary Reading Inventory and De Hesley. And, and the state of Texas wanted to know, you know, how are these children doing? And so, um, so for this many years, more than 20 years, right? Um, we've looked at risk factors, right? That's what we're looking for. So we're not going to identify someone in kindergarten, right? But we're going to look, you know, do they know their letters and sounds? You know, uh, what was the language of, this is the thing, what was the language of instruction in that classroom? And how did they do on that universal screener? And how did they do in comparison to their peers, right? So if everyone's having trouble, then I know, okay, something's not right in this classroom. They're not addressing some of the skills that we're looking for. But what are those early identifiers are? And remember, I told you how much transfers in this area of phonological awareness across languages. It's not only between Spanish and English. I mean, it's in other languages as well, like Italian and English. I mean, just think about it. If I can process sounds, I might not know the words, but I'm processing the sounds and playing with the sounds of the language. That tells me a lot. So uh, if they're not doing well and identifying a letter and its sound and they're not doing well, you know, with phonological awareness, those are risk factors. Uh, and then we do things on like our test of like for listening comprehension and kind of looking on both sides of the rope. Uh, but those are early risk factors. And then my, maybe if I'm having an MTSS, then we provide some work now. Um, and we don't in kindergarten, you know, we might have if they went to preschool, this kindergarten readiness way but we you know by the end of kindergarten what we found is you know children like in Spanish they were already reading it was like quite amazing and so as we did the future studies we had you know we included reading little short passages because that's what this you know that's what the norm was for the students think about it kindergarten now looks like first grade from when I went to school in kindergarten now it looks like first grade they learned so much but what you're looking for are those early signs and the early signs think about are the phonological awareness and that letter sound. And then by first grade, can they not only have phonological awareness and letter sound, but the, you know, can they read and, and we start to look at spelling because those are the core features of dyslexia, that phonological awareness, decoding and spelling. For the English learner, we know that uh, what we have to look at is the language of instruction to the matching that to the language of the screener. And by the way, on that MTSS for L's uh, rubric, it'll tell you about, there's all these little markers and categories that you should go through as you think about screening. Dr. David Francis at the University of Houston is really demonstrating and writing about now about how you can get different results if you didn't match the language of instruction. That's not really going to be valid if, how can I test them in a language that they weren't taught in right and so and maybe they're being taught across two languages so i need to look across the two languages to determine if you know if if i have this problem only in one and not the other then then that's a problem i did a on coloring colorado you all might say color in colorado i did a oh my god like a hundred years ago and it's they still have it on there um all about assessment for bilingual students and and it's on that it's a webinar um and um they still have it on there so i look very young back then but anyway the 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 information still stands true today as it did like i don't know 15 years ago whatever 10 years ago whenever that was Oh my God, Aaron Kruger, you're so quick. It's right there. <laughs> How do y'all do that? Oh my God. 
they're they're on it they're, they're on working. it my gosh <laughs> yeah. good never never underestimate the power of a motivated teacher i say yeah uh, oh i remember that webinar okay good <laughs> Exactly. So last one, and then this, this should take just a minute if, you, if, you, if you're aware of a resource like this out here, because I'm, I'm also curious. Um, are you aware of a list or a collection of commonly used academic content-oriented orient, cognates um, yes. between, between English and Spanish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you can also find by subject matter on Colorín Colorado. They have that on there. So yeah, very helpful. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Thank you so much. Thank this you guys. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening in and, you know, just really go out and reach and teach these children. Think about their language. Think about their literacy skills. Think about bringing in their culture and, and uh, making them be engaged and related and, and, and treat them very specially. They'll never forget you. Couldn't, couldn't. And we'll, we'll leave it at that. All right. We'll see everyone the next time around. Thank you. Bye-bye.